You know what? We all want love. But most of us don't want to date to get it because let's be honest, dating kind of sucks. But I fully believe it doesn't have to if we actually know what we're doing. Hi, I'm Kira Sabin, and this is Reinventing Dating, a smart and sweary podcast for all singles to learn the mindsets and skills to date with intention and confidence. Join me weekly as I break down the science and psychology behind what's working in our dating culture and what isn't. Every week, I'll bring a new topic, a trend, a skill, or mindset that can help us get out of our own way to learn how to date for relationships that we actually want. Because I fully believe and know that love isn't broken, but dating kind of is. So let's reinvent it together. Well, hello there, sugar pantses, and welcome to another episode of Reinventing Dating. I'm Kira, hanging out here in Wisconsin with shitty seasonal allergies. Any other allergy people out there? What are you doing? I don't know why, but flowers are trying to kill me this year. I don't know what it is, or spring is trying to kill me, but if you also have allergies... And figure it out. I don't know. I know there's shots now. I know there's all these other things. Let me know. I am dying. Couple of quick announcements. Number one, you can sign up. It's official for the May date. It is May 18th. The date for this month's date like you fucking mean it. It is a one day group workshop. You can... Just be there and participate as much or as little as possible. It's more about teaching than anything. But I'm now doing these monthly. They're $99. It's totally worth your time. Even if you're thinking about dating. Even if you just like a scotch. Scotch thinking about dating. This can help just put you on the right track. Check it out. Go to date.reinventingdating.com. I made a really cute page with a bunch of gifts in it, starting with Paul Rudd, who doesn't like Paul Rudd, but go check it out. $99, spread the word. I want this to become a thing. I want us to all start talking about how to date smarter, better, healthier, and so we can get into relationships that actually keep love around. Check it out at date.reinventingdating.com. And I have an I have an announcement that I feel is super <laughs> I'm laughing as I say it. But I just want to say for those of my people who have been talking to me about Taylor Swift for so many years and over the last few years I'm like I like this song. I think I'm a full I, I think I'm a full on Swifty. I'm going to just say it. I think that in all of the problems in the world Taylor Swift is far from one of them. And this new album I have been listening to literally on fucking repeat, like at least a couple of the songs, because that's what my ADHD brain loves to do, on repeat for a week. Not even joking. It's cool if it's not your thing, but I feel like it's controversial for Gen Xers to like Taylor Swift. And I'm just going to say, I think that she's part of what's good for the world. Man, if you don't agree with that, that's cool. You can just ignore this and move on with your life. But... If you haven't listened, it's really good. And I think I am not a lyrics person, right? I find that Danny's very much a lyrics person. We talk about that because I'll say something about how much I like a song. And he's like, God, that song's so depressing. I'm like, is because I'm literally listening to the notes, the melodies, the... I love a good layering. That's the kind of stuff I'm listening to. I'm rarely listening to the words. But damn, if I don't think Taylor so a poet listening to this album, I'm like, yes, that's so good. Yes, I feel that. Yes, I mean, I get it. I think I finally get it. And not that I needed this, but seeing not one, but two of my favorite 80s actors from pretty much my favorite one of my favorite 80s movies, which is, oh, Captain, My Captain, Dead Poet Society. I have only watched it a couple times in my life. That's how important that movie is to me. 
I saw it kind of on a date in high school, which I barely dated in high school. So, but I cried the, like the whole second half. <laughs> it was, I think, maybe the first time that I had sobbed in a movie theater. And I fucking loved it. I loved it so much. I loved Josh Charles as Knox Overstreet. And of course, we've got Ethan Hawke and we've got Robert Sean Leonard. And we've just got such an incredible cast. And the fact that whenever when I heard Tortured Poets Department, I was like, that felt like Dead Poet Society. And so having them be in a video, I was like, this is the collaboration I need in my life right now. It really, really is. I'm excited about the episode today because this is an episode that I did a long time ago and is now in the Kira podcast vault. But I've had more than a couple of clients recently where this has come up and I was like, eh, it is time to do that podcast again. And today we're talking about the very common mistake I see people make while dating. And it's dating for potential. And not only do I think that dating for potential isn't helpful, when we are doing that, it kind of makes us an asshole. Now, a well-intentioned asshole, a unconsciously manipulative asshole, but an asshole just the same. Let me get into it. So let's start with basics. You know, I love to start with the basics. And let's just talk about potential, what I mean by that, what dating for potential can look like. Because I think that I say this regularly or we hear it like don't date for potential. And we don't really know what that means because of course, when we are dating, when we are meeting people, we can only guesstimate who they're going to be in this relationship kind of the person they're going to turn into or evolve into. And so it's very easy to unconsciously date for potential, unconsciously see not only who they are, but the person that they might possibly be or or think they could possibly be, and then want to date them and help them become that person. That feels so kind and, and, and intentional in a beautiful way when I say it. But I'm going to talk a little bit about why today that's not only unhelpful, it's not going to get us to love, which I will say every fucking week is the reason I am here to help you date and build relationships that create love that you that you can feel every single day. Because it doesn't matter how much you like them, how attracted you are to them, how excited you are about them, how good the sex is, whatever it is, if you are dating for potential, you are sabotaging the relationship. So potential, according to dictionary.com, is possible as opposed to actual. That hurts a little bit, doesn't it? Capable of being or becoming, possibility, So AI, yeah, that's right. So I typed in dating for potential, kind of looking at what other people were talking about. But this is what uh, AI gave me this morning. Dating for potential can mean looking for someone who could potentially be a good match, but not yet is. The goal of dating is to identify potential, explore it, and confirm it. However, dating for potential can be a sign of low self-worth and insecurities. It can lead to people choosing for incompatible relationships, ignoring red flags, and giving too much time to someone who isn't right for them. I think that kind of works. AI also said, some say that dating for potential can be a source of frustration. When people fall in love with potential, they may refuse to see somebody as they are in real time, and instead play into the illusion that their love will transform them into their perfect match. This can lead to unhealthy fixation on who their partner could become, which can cause the relationship to deteriorate. Also not wrong. And then finally, AI gave us 
Some dating advice suggests not basing dating decisions on what someone could potentially bring to your life, but rather on their present actions. This includes focusing on effort, both yours and theirs, and the action that comes from it. You can also find clarity by focusing on how they show up in the relationship versus how you wish they would. And I'd like to say that I actually think that's a really good explanation of different ways I see people dating for potential. It's the possibility of who that person could be versus who that person is. We have to date people exactly where they're at. And I'm going to tell you how you're going to do that, why you're going to do that, and why it matters. So before I go into why dating for potential isn't great for your relationships, isn't going to ultimately turn into love. I just think the number one thing I want you to take away from today is the reality of who they are and where they are at is always going to be way more important than the potential of who they can be. Whether they're the person telling you about who they want to be or you're the person making up in your mind who you think they could be. So the number one reason that you dating for potential makes you an asshole is that everyone deserves to be loved for exactly who they are and where they are at. I'm going to say that again. Everyone deserves to be loved for exactly who they are and where they are at. Now, I'm going to keep talking about that, so stay with me. But ultimately... We should never be attaching and spending time with people when we don't like the person who they are right now. If we are only with someone because we see the potential of how amazing they will be when or if they get that promotion or a better job, change their body, lose some weight go to therapy, which they may or may not ever do. And by the way, those are not my thoughts or my words, but some things that I do see coming up in our dating culture and with my clients. But these potentials, these things that you are holding on to, there's a very good chance this is a condition you are putting on that person or the relationship that the other person hasn't agreed to which is shitty because everybody deserves to be loved exactly where they are at. And if you cannot love that person for exactly where they are at, there's many reasons why that could be, by the way, but you should not be with that person because they should be with somebody who loves them as is. Or as I'm going to discuss discuss in a moment, they might have some behaviors or things they need to work on. But more importantly, that leads us to number two, which is you can't fix anybody's shit. No matter how much you love them, you inspire them, you encourage them, or even if you try to do things for them, it never works. Real change only comes when they do it themselves. Now, not only is this just a Kira theory, a Curie, oh my God, how have I never come up with that in 16 years? And it's terrible. I won't use it again, but just the same. There is some great science and psychology behind this. So I'm going to give a quick teaching moment with Kira about extrinsic versus versus intrinsic motivation. So extrinsic is probably a little bit about what you think. X meaning external. So Extrinsic motivation is a motivation to do something or participate in an activity based on the external goals. That might include receiving praise or approval, winning a competition, receiving an award or a payment, but you are doing it for external validation. You are doing it because you want people to see your worth versus intrinsic motivation. 
The intrinsic motivation is the motivation to do something that comes from within the individual. It's the incentive to complete a task because it's interesting or enjoyable or really important to us. It's something we want to do to maybe become a better person or because we want to add that to our life, not because our family, our friends, the world is going to shame us if we don't. So look at anything that you want to stick to or you want to do and it's not working. My guess is that ultimately it's an extrinsic motivation. You are not internally motivated. You're doing it for others or for what you look like to others. And how I see that show up in dating and relationships is a lot of time people will be tired or maybe burned out from dating or need a reset or need a little bit of time. And they'll keep pushing themselves to the point of burnout or resentment because maybe they have a parent who keeps making comments about their single child or wanting a grandkid or they're feeling left out of their friendships because their friends are now in a relationship and they're not even sure if they want a relationship, but they just don't want to fucking feel alone or feel like they are missing out on what their friends are doing right now. Now, that is a motivation, but it's not a motivation that's ultimately going to create great results. Not when it comes to things that are really, really important to us. So going back to number two, which is you can't fix anybody's shit, no matter how much you love them, inspire them, encourage them, and even do it for them, it never works. Real change only comes when they do it themselves and for themselves. So if you're out there setting up the therapy appointments, if you're out there trying to get them working out or going out on the weekends, if you're the one trying to schedule maybe an appointment for antidepressants and it's not being led by them, there's a very good chance it's not going to stick and you are going to be back where you started. Which leads me to number three, which I think is really fucking important. Sometimes we meet somebody and we like a lot of qualities about them, but maybe there's some really bad behavior going on. Maybe there's some addiction. Maybe there's some severe emotional dysregulation. Maybe they have some very unhealthy coping skills and coping mechanisms and you're ignoring it. That's another dating for potential because you're dating them with the hopes that this potentially will change. The hopes that maybe if you're there and you're loving them enough and you're taking care of them enough and you're supporting them enough that that behavior will change and then the relationship will be what you want and it's okay. But number three is if there's some really bad behavior going on there and you are allowing it, you are enabling them by not allowing them to fail and change. So not only does it make you an asshole and not get you a good relationship, you are actually holding them back from better lives. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean that we don't wake up on a Saturday like today and just say, you know what? I'm kind of sick of my own shit and I'm going to change everything right now. I'm going to look at all of my stuff and as of today, I'm just going to change it. I'm going to create a better movement and workout schedule and stick to it. I'm going to do this or that or blah, all the things that you have on the schedule. We all can do that in our brains. And then we almost all know that two days or two weeks or two months later, we have gone back to usually the schedule in the life that we had before. It's not really fun to admit, but everything we do, healthy or unhealthy, is serving us. We are doing it for a reason. We are believing it for a reason. Usually it's to help us feel safe or protect us, 
even if it's not actually helping us be safe or protected. But our brains are little wacky creatures. But you and I both know that's not how change works. If we could all just any day of the week get up and truly change our worst behavior, we'd be a different fucking species. The human race would look very differently than it does now. That's not how the world or life or humans work. So if that person has some behavior that is keeping that relationship from really feeling good, feeling safe, feeling stable, or moving forward, us tolerating it, us ignoring it, us just hoping it's going to get better or sneakily and manipulatingly, that's a word, doing things to make it better. You are enabling their behavior because we all know that change really only comes when shit gets bad. When we look around and we're like, I'm not happy. And there are things that I am doing and we acknowledge those things that are making us unhappy. Sometimes it's stuff that we numb out to, whether that be booze or drugs or food or technology. There can be a thousand different things. And and some are real relationship stoppers and some of them aren't. But ultimately, if you're dating someone and you know there's some behavior that's not working for this relationship... And you're just praying on it changing or hoping that you can love them enough for it to change. Not only is that not real and completely unhelpful for you, you are not letting that person hit their rock bottom or their fail to wake up that one day and say, I'm going to have to get some real fucking help to change. Because the average person is not going to just change that behavior because one day they woke up and decided to. We usually all have to hit a pretty tough place, maybe in our loneliness, maybe with our health, maybe with our jobs and how unhappy we are, before we take a big ass look at our lives and usually get the support and help to make that change. Because if we could do it ourselves by just waking up and thinking about it, we do it. Which leads us to number four, just because you are there tirelessly supporting someone through some really rough stuff does not automatically mean that they will stay with you and love you forever. In fact, dating them with that intention is based in fear, not love. I see a ton of my clients, particularly women, fall into is this idea that there's something wrong with them because they tried so hard in that relationship. They gave so much and did so much for the other person. They think that's going to guarantee them love and that they are unlovable when that person does not stay, does not commit, behaves badly, You can't love someone out of their deepest fears and trauma. You can't. That is work they have to do themselves. And it doesn't matter how much you show up, how much you support, if they're not ready to make those changes. And I hear a lot of people make excuses or justifications for staying with somebody who is not healthy, who is not ready to be a partner. And they say it's because of love. I've fallen in love with them. I'm in love with them. Tell me how tirelessly staying and trying to fix another person who isn't willing to do that work for themselves is actually love. It's not. It's fear. Love is seeing that person where they're at and loving them, but also knowing that they may not be ready for a relationship. Love is seeing a person where they're at, but not trying to build a relationship with somebody 
who is in a tough or rough space in their life. I don't need any Bob or Barbara the Builders here. Which leads me to number five, which is when they are in a healthier place, there is a good chance they will move on to someone who is also healthy and doesn't find their worth in fixing people and knows how to show up as themselves, not a fixer. Now, a quick story time. I have seen this play out in real life with a couple of different couples I know. Now, I'm not going to go into specifics, but here's the gist. One person met the other person when that person was in a tough place. Maybe they were grieving an ex or a parent. Maybe they were really dealing with depression and couldn't find a job they liked. Maybe they were dealing with an addiction that they didn't want to choose to deal with yet. So what happens when that person does heal? Because you stayed long enough for them to finally get to a place where they're like, yes, I'm going to work on this. I think that we think that's the ultimate goal. That we have laid our lives and dramatically loved someone until they could love themselves or some kind of bullshit like that. Instead of showing up as two reasonably healthy people who are willing to work together to work through the tough stuff together. But let's say they did get there. I've actually seen people stay in relationships for 20 years before the person got there. And then guess what happened when they did? Did they finally turn into the perfect partner that you were so hoping they would be? No. No, in fact, the power struggle or the just relationship struggles they could not work through because they were so used to one person doing virtually everything and the other person doing nothing that they didn't know how to turn it into a healthy relationship when that person healed. That's real. And the fucked up part is when we have learned that we have to earn love, that we have to work for love, that love always has conditions, that when both people are showing up, that feels intimidating, that feels overwhelming because we don't know our role anymore. When our role was only fixing, when our role was only tirelessly supporting and caring about people. That's not love. That's not a healthy relationship. And it's a choice. If you have the gift of giving, the gift of loving to support and help others, that is a beautiful fucking thing. I'd like to think that I have that gift on some level. But what I learned the hard way was that I could do that in my job or my career or this business. But our relationships can't be like that. We have to have a stable and safe place to come home to, whether that mean physically or figuratively or emotionally. We can be givers, we can be kind, we can even be fixers and get paid for it. Be a nurse, be a teacher, be a therapist or a social worker. But make sure that your relationships and friendships are safe and stable and consistent or you will constantly be exhausted in your life. There is nothing wrong with being a fixer. There is nothing wrong with being given that motivation and gifts. There's just going to be places for it. And our primary relationship is not one of them. Because number six is, if you do stay together, as a fixer, you will feel super uncomfortable in the relationship because you don't know what your role is now. Now that you're not trying to earn their love or fix their life. And sometimes we can't get out of those roles. 
we have been in those roles for so long that we don't know how to get out of them. And even with therapy, it makes it hard because we have played those roles for so long. Do yourself a favor. Date for where people are at. Because it's not only the kind thing to do, the loving thing to do, it is the smartest thing to do in dating. We're not looking for perfect people or instantly secure per- people. I don't know if that exists. But we are looking for people who are willing to acknowledge the growing pains and struggles of new and just relationships and the ability and amount of work that you're going to have to put into it for it to feel good on a daily basis. If you have two people willing to do that and willing to kind of dig in with a therapist or whoever, if things go south for a while, you're ahead of the game. My friend, you are ahead of most of the relationships out there. Because that's all it is. When people are like, what should I be looking for? And we're looking for these deep qualities. And we have these checklists. Look for curiosity and growth. Look for people who understand that it's not going to magically work out. That you both are going to have to figure out how to do that and solve conflicts. I embarrassingly will tell you right now that it probably took until my late 30s, early 40s to solve a conflict with somebody I cared about because I would just cut them out of my life, which is a lack of boundaries. And that brings me to number seven, which is when we date for potential, when we come in as a fixer who is swooping in to focus on the other person help support them, take care of them, work through their shit, whatever it is, we start that relationship unbalanced and in a power struggle with a focus on them. And then you unknowingly teach them that their needs are more important in the relationship than your needs. Think about it. The focus has been completely on them and their unhealed shit for a while. When you are tending to somebody that hugely in your relationship, when you are tending to one person and both people don't get to have good days and bad days and in between and the support when they need it, you are once again teaching people how to treat you and you are teaching them that their needs and their troubles and their trauma is more important than yours. And we're not looking for any angels here or any saviors. Love surely isn't, because that's not love. We're looking for those who can show up. We're looking for those who can ask for what they need. We're looking for those who can set boundaries. We're looking for those who can teach people how to treat them and pick up on how to treat others without manipulating the situation, which is what people pleasing and fixing actually is. And those people absolutely exist. But we have to know how to date to actually find them and get in a relationship with them. Dating is a skill. Dating is a mindset. Relationship building and tending is a skill and mindset. These are skills and mindsets you can learn. And you can remove all fucking shame that you don't know them because nobody ever taught them. We're still learning very basics about relationships in 2024. We are still understanding how humans rupture and repair, how they can fight fair, how they can show up and love each other. And at the end of the day, the only relationship I can really, really, really attest to is my own. But I know That although Danny and I don't do this perfectly, we do it openly and honestly. We keep turning to each other. We keep showing up for each other. And we keep asking the tougher questions so that this feels good. That's what I teach people to do, guys. Just a reminder, 
And a great place to start is Date Like You Mean It. 99 bucks. Next one's in May 18th. Can't make that one. Make the June one. Can't make that one. Do the July one. I'm doing them monthly. Once a Saturday, whether there's five people or 50 people, I don't care. I will keep running these because I believe these are at least some of the foundational mindsets and skills we need for dating. And don't spend the next 15 years of your life learning what I learned. Just you don't have to do that because that's what I'm teaching. All right, guys, that's it for today. I hope that was helpful. I, I feel like it is because I feel like it took me a really fucking long time to learn these things. And if I were able to have learned them younger, I might have done better. If you liked this, please subscribe so you don't miss any of the future episodes with this kind of dating genius. And also share it with everybody you know. Regularly, we are meeting people who are getting a divorce or just have become single. Let them know you like this podcast. It's helpful and it gets it out there. Finally, if you love it, please leave a review, whether it's just some stars on Apple or Spotify or writing down what you really love about this podcast. I read every single one. They fucking make my day. You become a hero in my mind for a day or two. And it just makes the world a little bit better place. All right, guys, I'll be here next week. And until then, meet love halfway. <laughs>